students 
and this parallel truth emerged for me. Paul, who had no doubt that he had been set free from the bondage of works, willingly left his citizenship behind to become a citizen of a new kingdom that he did <coughs> not earn. It is his grace that works that transferred Paul to the kingdom of God's Son, carrying him to the place of freedom from sin through Christ's redemption. In Colossians 1, 13 and 14, Paul wrote, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And there was no way Paul was ever going back. He was a citizen now of the new kingdom, dedicated to becoming a productive citizen of the kingdom he'd been transferred to. Freed from the tyranny of the domain of darkness, yet a willing bond servant until the king he now served would come to take him home with him forever. And to the church in Philippi he wrote, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul willing, willingly picked up the mantle and answered the call to preach the truth of the gospel as he related to the Galatians, relying on his grace that works to preserve his truth. So now, 14 years after that two-week visit that he had with Cephas and a brief meeting with James, the Lord's brother, Paul is back before the who's who in the church of Jerusalem. And this time, he is with his ministry partners. He has taken Barnabas, known as the son of encouragement, and Titus, a Gentile convert. In chapter 2 begins, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. Paul chose to bring two partners in the faith with him. First, Barnabas who had been set apart by the Holy Spirit as Paul's preaching companion to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. In Acts 13, we read, While they, meaning the disciples and uh, apostles, were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, who would become Paul, for the work to which I have called them. Barnabas had been an eyewitness to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on those Gentile converts. A little more history. Remember the persecution that erupted after the stoning of Stephen? And as persecuted believers were scattered abroad, the gospel message like seed was sown in the hearts of the Gentiles, in the soil of the Gentiles' hearts. Remember our study in James? And in Acts 11, we read, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, also preaching the Lord Jesus. It's another example of what we considered last week, his grace that works throughout history. Even when at first glance, the events seem to resemble anything but good. But the persecution at the hands of the enemy was being worked out for the good of many in the hands of his grace that works. Oh, that we would grow in our faith to trust him in those times that, can't, that we can't seem to reconcile our trials with his good plans. Because as a result of the persecution... Look what happened. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, there's quite a stir. Barnabas, son of encouragement, was a Hellenist, meaning he was a Jew who was born outside of the Holy Land, and he spoke Greek. And Barnabas had already become a respected leader in the church in Jerusalem. So they send the encouraging, reliable Barnabas to go investigate these claims that Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ. And we see his grace at work meeting the Greeks in their own native language. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. 
Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And then, of course, the encourager goes to find Saul. And together they encourage and they strengthen those new believers in Antioch for an entire year. He left for Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Soon after, the Holy Spirit would call the disciples to set apart Barnabas and Saul, the Apostle Paul, to his grace that works to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. It's interesting to note here, they were not ministering to each other. They were ministering to the Lord. They were engaged in worshiping the only one who is worthy of worship. And in the midst of this all-consuming devotion, the Holy Spirit sets Paul and Barnabas apart. And what did he set them apart to do? What they were already doing. Both Paul and Barnabas had already answered the call to preach to the surrounding areas. And as the Holy Spirit set his seal of approval on the ministry of Paul and Barnabas, the church in Antioch was then called to join them through sending them away to answer the call. This word, this phrase, send them away, literally means to release. The brethren let go of their beloved Paul and Barnabas for the purpose of expanding the kingdom. Everyone had to die to self. And isn't this the way the kingdom is to be built? Through death, just as Jesus said. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. What areas might we need to die to that the kingdom be built to bear much fruit. Maybe like the church in Antioch, we may need to release people we love. Or perhaps we may need to die to our preferences so that the gospel can reach those who are different than us. Perhaps we need to die to some of our material desires and release some funds to grow the kingdom. So let's commit to spend time ministering to the Lord that we might hear how he desires us to be set apart and sent away for his purposes. And besides Barnabas on this trip, Paul also brings along Titus. Titus was a Gentile, and Bible scholars believe he was most probably brought to faith by Paul. When Paul wrote to Titus, he said, To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, Grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Titus became a fellow worker with Paul in teaching and strengthening the Gentiles in their faith. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for you, as for our brethren, they are messengers of the churches and glory to Christ. And ultimately, Titus would become an overseer of the churches on the large island of Crete. For this reason I left you in Crete, Titus, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I've directed you. Both Barnabas and Titus had been eyewitnesses of the work of the Holy Spirit among the Gentiles. And again we see God's faithful provision through his grace that works to provide co-laborers in the when Paul was called to go into an openly difficult situation, God provided help through these men who would both stand beside him and back his word as truth. At this point in Paul's letter, he informs the Galatians as to why he would come to face those who stood as the pillars of the church. He was not answering the call of anyone but God. 
It was because of a revelation that I went up. Paul doesn't offer any other explanation, but he makes it clear he came to Jerusalem not because the apostles had summoned him. He came because in a revelation, God had somehow instructed him to do so. This was critical because Paul was fighting for the purity of the gospel message. But yet we still hear humility in his demeanor. And I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. It's a lesson in approach. Paul had no doubt he was preaching the true gospel. He had received it from Jesus Christ himself. But questions can need clarification. There are times when Paul spoke hard truth with no sugarcoating whatsoever, and we'll hear more of that next week. But perhaps the revelation that had sent him up to Jerusalem also included instructions on how to present his case in private before the three pillars of the church, James, Cephas, and John. Paul submits his message to the scrutiny of the church leaders to set their fears to rest. Paul had no doubt his message was truth, but the pillars of the church had questions. And as we see Paul rely on his grace that works to preserve his truth, Paul humbly submits his ministry before the leaders of the Jerusalem church. A real lesson for speaking the truth in love. And Paul also brought a living piece of evidence. Titus, the Gentile, who did not succumb to the pressures of the Judaizers, but he had come to saving faith through the gospel message and the gospel message alone. Titus refused to desert the gospel of grace just so he could avoid disapproval of Judaizers. Paul wrote, not even Titus, who was with me, though he was Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. <clears throat> Think of how the Lord might use our lives if we refuse to compromise. Let's learn a, life, a lesson from Titus. Fitting in with the legalists through the works of the law. you got to do this. You better do this. You better not do this. Fitting in with legalists will never must never, should never, can never dissuade us from resting in his grace that works to preserve his truth. And while Paul was humble, he was never timid in delineating between the erroneous claims of the legalists and the true message of the gospel of grace. It is important to note that Paul was not condemning circumcision itself but only that Judaizers insisted it was necessary for salvation. In other words, the Judaizers were preaching something like a gospel that sounded something like Jesus' death plus. And for that, Paul would not. He could not stand idly by. Later in this letter, he will point us to Abraham, which he also did extensively in his letter to the Romans. Stating the fact that circumcision was not commanded in the law so that we would be made righteous. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 4. Faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision. The sign of circumcision. A seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. So that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised. That righteousness might be credited to them. In other words, God justified Abraham because of his faith. And it was at least 14 years later after the declaration of Abraham's faith and that was credited to him as righteousness before Abraham would be circumcised. In, the, in Genesis, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Not until 14 years later was he circumcised.
The act of circumcision was much like our act of baptism today. Baptism doesn't save us. Baptism is an outward sign of a heart that's sealed in a covenant with holy God through surrendered faith. But the false teachers kept hammering this false message, and this was throwing the believers into this whirlwind of confusion. And Paul said, it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy at our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. And while Paul humbly submitted the gospel he preached to the church leadership, he boldly squashed the attempts of the Judaizers to usher in adherence once more to the law, which would place the believers in bondage to something that was totally impossible to even attain. When Paul encouraged believers to peace, he was not advocating peace by compromise, peace at any cost. Remember his stand against compromising the true gospel that we read in Galatians chapter 1? If anyone preaches a gospel contrary, I don't care if it's your beloved pastor or if it's an angel from heaven, if it's me, he's to be accursed. That's what Paul said. He took a bold stand against compromising the true gospel. And the reality is true peace will only come in a body through a unified commitment to his preservation of the truth. In Ephesians, Paul wrote, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. In Philippians, he wrote, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in chapter 2 of Philippians, he wrote, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Conduct worthy of the gospel is a commitment to strive for the faith of the gospel, not the works of of a false gospel message. So Paul did, definitely did not buy into peace at any cost. He knew that the truth of the gospel message was at stake, and that was something worth striving for. And that is something that takes resolve. And as he wrote, but we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour. Those false teachers that snuck in and crept around we didn't yield for even an hour. Why? So that the truth of the gospel would remain with you, Galatian believers. There's no denying that we live in real tumultuous times. And wouldn't we all love to have peace? But more and more, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is challenged as either being not enough, and so it demands our assistance, through keeping up with our to-do list, or the gospel is accused of being much too narrow and even bigoted against those who believe that what God calls sin is really just a matter of choice. And the cries are growing louder, insisting that those intolerant, ignorant Christians really should be silenced. But the truth of the gospel message is at stake. And while there's nothing we can ever add to the gospel, there must also be nothing that we ever remove. God's word declares that salvation is solely his gift of grace and also makes known the sinfulness of man, the holiness of God, his holy wrath, and the reality of eternal punishment apart from faith in Christ. None of this can be rejected for even an hour, that the whole truth of the gospel remains. And we too can find our encouragement and courage as we rely on his grace to preserve his truth. Imagine the bold obedience of Paul before these renowned apostles. How was it that Paul was able to stand strong before the who's who of the Jewish believers? Because Paul knew a good reputation a good standing in a church or a synagogue is not what God was concerned with. In 2.6, Paul wrote, 
But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. That's a side thought. God shows no partiality because, as we've all heard before, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. For all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Paul certainly knew that all his advancement in Judaism had brought him no closer to the Lord. And we need to learn well the lesson from Paul. For if God is not impressed by reputation, why should we be? Self-examination. Are my eyes more on others than on the Lord? We can be encouraged by another's walk, but we are not in a race against each other. God sets our individual race before us, and as we fix our eyes not on those around us, but on Jesus, it is then that we will run well. As Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews wrote, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. Paul, Paul was able to stand strong because he obeyed all that the Lord had revealed to him. Self-examination. Is there anything the Lord is revealing to us that calls for a radical step of obedience, that calls our eyes to be fixed on Jesus and away from others? For in Paul's commitment to fix his eyes on Jesus, and contend for the faith, rather than seeking approval of those who were of high reputation, Paul depended only on the Lord's provision and was thereby able to confront the higher-ups with confidence. During this meeting with those who's who in the Jerusalem church, held in private, God honored Paul's commitment as it became evident to the church leaders that Paul's gospel needed no help or clarification, no contribution of insight or truth from them. And he goes on to write, well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. And he's talking about a contribution to the message of the gospel. Again, we're reminded that the gospel message Paul preached was not according, not according to anyone other than Jesus Christ directly received by divine revelation, Galatians 1.12. Paul was not schooled by any apostle or any other man. He was schooled and taught by his Savior. And Paul confirms that even those big wigs had nothing to add to the gospel he preached. And although Paul shows respect to these leaders' position in the church, he also brings it down to this. When it comes to God's kingdom, there is no hierarchy but one. God is sovereign. As we've been hearing from our pastor, he is the sovereign ruler and all the rest of us are simply called to follow him in obedience in whatever the role and responsibility he has assigned. And the reputed pillars of the church, they got the message. But on the contrary, seeing that I have been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised just as Peter had been to the circumcised. The gospel message preached to the Gentiles, Gentiles was the same message preached to the Jews. Nothing new was contributed by the pillars of the church. It was only the target audience that had changed. And Paul would again point the spotlight on his grace, for it is his grace that works in his workers to preserve his truth. No matter who we're called to share with, the Spirit of God is present in us to effectually work, to open our mouths with clarity and boldness. And he goes on to write in verse 8, For he, the Lord, who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. Paul took no credit. He relied on God to do what only God can do. And in this argument, he's squaring off once more with the Judaizers. Since God shows no partiality, God's grace will work through his workers to bring the gospel message to those he has placed in our past, starting in the home. 
and then extending to our work, our school, our community, and even those in our church who may not yet understand, who may not yet have trusted his gospel of grace. I want to do, uh, have a side note here for clarity because Paul goes back and forth between Cephas and Peter. Are these one and the same? The New Testament was written in the common Greek of the time. And Petros, Peter, was the word that was used in Greek. But it's most likely that Jesus called him Cephas, which is the Aramaic word for rock since Aramaic was the common language where Jesus grew up in Galilee. Paul used both terms, like we might talk about Robert or Bob, or William or Bill, Pat, Patricia or Patty. In the scriptures, he is called Simon, Simon Peter, Peter, and Cephas. But I did do some reading to see if I could find out why did he call him Cephas and why did he call him Peter? And I found out this. No one knows for certain. <laughs> but there are some Bible scholars that have concluded that verse 7 and 8, when he calls him Peter, Paul may have been citing an official document that would have tra been transcribed in Greek, the universal language of that day, regarding responsibilities in sharing the gospel that had been worked out between Paul and the pillars. And that's a, that is a probability, but we don't know for certain. But we can be for certain of this. Cephas and Peter are one and the same. And at this point, Paul again calls his attention, calls our attention to his grace that undeniably works to preserve his truth through unity, the unity of the faith. The apostles in Jerusalem could not deny God's grace at work in the Gentiles. And the pillars recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars. Why? Because they were apostles. Gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. By giving them the right hand of fellowship, the three apostles were acknowledging that Paul and Barnabas were true ministers of the true gospel message, answering God's particular call and commission in their lives. And only one thing was asked of Paul and Barnabas. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. His grace that works calls us to care and serve those who have no means of reciprocating our acts of kindness. Because don't we look most like Christ? when we care for those who have nothing to offer us in return. And remember from our time in James, we learned about the kind of religion that God accepts in verse 27 of chapter 1. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Sometimes we associate this word religion with a system of organized works. But in the Greek, this word religion has the underlying sense of reverence and worship. Orphans and widows represented the poorest of the poor. And as we learned from Karen in our study in James, people who know grace give grace. When we know there is no way to be compensated and we still choose to give, we manifest the generous and gracious character of God. And that is our acceptable, reverent worship to holy God. Remembering the poor is not a work of the flesh. It's an overflow of a heart that's been transformed. Because we have received his great grace, we extend his great grace to others. Remembering the poor is the cultural norm of our citizenship, our kingdom, our heavenly kingdom. That is pure and faultless reverence and worship. It is not a to-do list. It's an overflow of his grace that works in us to preserve his truth and display his grace to others. While this letter is Paul's apologia, his defense 
for the gospel of grace. And Paul presents evidence and facts we need to know. Paul never claimed that all we need to do is know truth in our hearts. God calls us to know truth that he might grow us in the truth so that his truth will grow in us. But we have to know it before he can grow it. And that's his grace that works to bring him glory and preserve his truth. Amen. Amen. Just a reminder, next week is first and foremost prayer. Um, don't look at next week as a night off. We need to be praying. God has some plans for our community. Come together and let's get on our knees and our faces before Holy God and ask him to show us. Let's minister to the Lord next week so that we can be set apart and answer the call to what he's calling us to. And the following week after that, we will be in Galatians, the second half, verses 11 through 21. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace that works. Without your grace, um, we are without hope. So thank you for the hope that you give. Thank you for um, teaching us how to rest in you, rely on you, and understand that if anything at all happens, through us that is good, it is your grace that works in us. Mm -hmm. And our desire, Lord, is to minister to you so that you would have your way in us. Lord, I pray for our times in our small group. Um, Lord, that you would just lead us and bless that conversation and um, grow, grow relationships and friendships and um, expand our hearts for the things of you. In Jesus' name. Thank you.